reporté numéro 10, S210. Senator Modi. Thank you, Your Honor. Honorable Senators, I move that this bill be read a second time. This move by the Honorable Senator Moody, seconded by the Honorable Senator Meiji, that this bill be read a second time on debate. Senator Moody. Thank you, Your Honor. Honorable Senators, it is a great honor for me to speak to you today at second reading on the sponsor for Bill S-210, an act to establish the Office of the Commissioner for Children and Youth in Canada. This bill was first tabled in June of this year, and I now have the honor of retabling the bill. Sometimes June feels like a lifetime away, and many things have changed in the past few months. So today, I'll speak to what we now know about the current needs of children and why this bill is more relevant and needed more than ever now. After almost 30 years since the ratification of the Convention of the Rights of Child, we still do not have a Commissioner for, Chil for Children and Youth. We are failing in our commitment to act on behalf of our children. Today, Can Canadian children remain in a state of crisis, where they've been for decades. More than ever, there is a need for immediate action now, and that is why we must make this bill a priority. So what is the situation for children today, colleagues? I have new data to share that tells a, a sad story of failed leadership for Canada as a country. Suicides are now the leading cause of death for children aged 10 to 14, while for youth 15 to 17 years old, it's the second highest cause of death. Still, thousands of children in Canada die every year due to preventable illnesses, in injuries, and accidents remain the, death, the cause of death for many. New data reveals that between 2017 and 18, family violence against children and youth has increased by 7%. While one in three children are victims of abuse, one in five children live in poverty, one in 10 children experience food insecurity. We have seen and are familiar with, in 2019, the Assembly of First Nations found that 47% of First Nations children living on reserve live in poverty. And when it comes to health and well being of children, our global ranking has slipped. And we have recent data to show that. Over 25% of our kids are obese and overweight. Concerns for mental health have increased considerably in the last decade. According to UNICEF's Child Wellbeing Report Card 2020, just released in September, Canada ranks 30th out of 38 OECD countries on measures of children's overall well-being. And there are many worrying signs, including the rising rate of child mortality out of 38 countries, we rank 28th. There are many worrying signs also that we see that today our infants are dying at a rate that is amongst the highest in OECD countries, with Nunavut's rate sitting at three times the national average. This report highlights the link between child mortality and the national income inequality and child poverty. UNICEF reports, and I quote, in Canada, child mortality is an important mark of extreme poverty and continuing social exclusion experienced by First Nations and by black populations. For instance, infant mortality is 3.9 times higher in areas with a higher concentration of Inuit people and 2.3 times higher in areas for First Nations people. Everything that we have heard today is happening in our communities, in our neighborhoods, and before our eyes. And we must ask ourselves, what will we do in response? More disturbing than the failure that these statistics reveal, colleagues, is our inaction as parliamentarians and as a country. We know that children are the most vulnerable amongst us. 
They depend on their parents, guardians, teachers, coaches, and on members of their community to be their voice and to provide them with protection and care. We're talking here about our children, Canada's children, and we can no longer ignore this crisis. I'd say to you today, regardless of where they're born, their ethnicity, their race, their sexual orientation, gender, or level of physical or mental ability, children and youth are our most precious resource and are, each and every one, deserving of every opportunity to grow, thrive, and to succeed. Senators, we have an obligation to do everything that we can to make Canada the best place to be a kid. And we know that this is unfinished business. We have been discussing and debating this topic of the Child Commissioner in Canada for far too long. While we have also shirked our obligation, by the way, under the, to, to children under the Convention of the Rights of the Children, the time has come for us to change all of this. Back in 1979, Senator, Lang, uh, Senator the Honorable Langdon Pearson committed her career to, uh, to advocating for the rights of Canadian children. Canada was known then as a leader and a champion for children's rights and well-being. And we were swift to adopt the, the Convention of the Rights of a Child when it was concluded. But despite receiving the advice of the UN to establish the role of the federal commissioner, we have failed to do so, and we have failed to fully implement the Convention. Since these recommendations were first made as far back as 25 years ago, the situation for our children here in Canada has only gotten worse. And by failing to address these issues, we have left our children vulnerable. And when COVID hit earlier this year, we were not equipped to protect them. For many years, there have been some really strong advocates for children within Canada. I mentioned before in my last speech, here within the Senate, three of our colleagues, Senators Lovelace, Nicholas, Jaffa, and Munson, have worked tirelessly to recommend and to advance action in this area. Some 13 years ago, their work as members of the Standing Senate Committee on Human Rights, led by Senator Andrew Chuck, studied children's rights and published the Senate report titled the Silent Citizens, where in which one of the primary proposals recommended then, 13 years ago, that a federal commissioner for children and youth be established. The identified purpose then for such an office was to promote responsible and good governance and to provide a seamless service delivery to children. 13 years ago, we have known here in the Senate, what we needed to do. Now is the time for us to act. Notwithstanding our clarity here in the Senate, in the other place, there's also been a significant nonpartisan recognition of the need for a commissioner for children and youth, where many have invested effort to address this needed legislation. And back as early as 2009, and as, as recently as 2019, current Minister Mark Garneau, former Minister Erwin Kotler, former Minister Dr. Kelly Leach, and MP Quach introduced similar bills. As recently as two weeks ago, I've spoken to some of these individuals, and I'm happy to say that Dr. Leach, former Minister Kotler, Senators Pearson and Andrew Truck are still completely to a person supportive of the establishment of the officer of the, of the children, the Commissioner for Children and Youth. And outside of the Parliament, we have multiple supporters. The Canadian Coalition of Rights of Children in 1991 pressed then for the establishment of a commissioner. Today, UNICEF Canada, the Canadian Council of Children and Youth Advocates, 
the Canadian Bar Association, the National Association of Friendship Centres, Children's Healthcare Canada, the Boys and Girls Club, and many others support the establishment. Another significant development occurred in 2019 when the final report of the inquiry on missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls called for, called for justice 12.9, called for a commissioner in every province, territory, and at the federal level. Also in March of 2019, the Canadian Coalition of Youth Advocates, that organization that unites provincial and territorial child and youth advocates across Canada, also called for the Commission of Children and Youth. And I quote from their call, for years, we have called for the creation of an independent parliamentary officer with a focus on ind indigenous children, young people migrating to Canada, and those involved with youth justice, health, and mental health systems. There are still too many children who fall outside our legislated mandates as they rely on federally funded services. They lack a rights-based resource for these young people is glaring. UNICEF, in their most recent report, Canada's report card 16, reported the commissioner as a game changer for youth. In their report, they write, children perceive well-being differently than adults. The voices of those furthest from opportunity must be included. Children and youth have shown over recent months that they intend to be included in discussions that will shape their futures. For adults and policymakers, it is now time to listen, learn, and act. A National Commissioner for Children and Youth and a lower voting age will help us do that. Children's First Canada, in their report, 2020 Raising Canada report, stated, this independent office of government plays a crucial role in advocating for children and youth, establishing that they are prioritized in the development of federal legislation, directly consulting and engaging with children, raising the profile of children across Canada. And now more than ever, a commissioner for children and youth is needed to promote the rights of young people and to hold government accountable. I'd like to highlight the words of a key young supporter, a young woman named Sarah Knockwood, who is one of the Mi'kmaq Confederacy of PEI and a founder of the PEI Children and Youth Table. Here are some excerpts from a letter that Sarah wrote to me. She says, greetings. My name is Sarah Knockwood. I wanted to tell you more about who I am and my views on the bill. I would love for a national commissioner to be established because they would pressure the government. For it to be an indigenous person would be really great too. It is very important for me because it means that communities can grow and become better. It means we can give hope to children. Sarah goes on to say, what is happening out there is not right. As an indigenous child, I can tell you that the children are losing hope. We have had enough and are willing to fight for our people. The problem is that there are 94 calls to action just sitting there. There's nothing being done. A lot of laws that affect us are federal, and the provincial advo advocates can't do anything about it. But I'm optimistic. I know it can be done, she says. The help of the National Commissioner would be an amazing step to healing for everyone, not just for indigenous problems, but for others as well. I'm Sarah Knockwood. I'm 15 years old, trying to get by at school. I only joined the PEI Children and Youth Table this year when COVID shut us down in our schools. And colleagues, 
I was tremendously touched by these words because growing up in the best of circumstances can be a challenge. But for too many Canadian children, growing up is a real struggle, a fight, a fight for survival and a fight for hope. We have a role to ensure the well-being of our children and to ensure that our children thrive. And we must play that role. That includes welcoming voices like Sarah into our democracy and, and welcoming greater accountability. Our children have a right to be heard and we have a responsibility to support that right. In 2021, we're about to face the next review by the United Nations on our implementation of the Convention of the Rights of a Child. Many Canadian organizations have shared with us their reports. On all of them seem to su suggest and have one common recommendation, the establishment of a federal commissioner for children and youth is a central part of all their recommendations. For Canada to fully implement the Convention of the Rights of the Child and play its role as an international human rights leader, we must do this. We must establish an independent voice for children and youth. So yes, senators, this is unfinished business. As Mark Garneau said back in 2012, there is no room for part partisanship today especially when we are talking about something as important as our children. Today I propose to you that the Commission of Children and Youth should be our first step in addressing the crisis facing children. And here are my reasons. First, Canadians have spoken. They want a commissioner for children and youth. Back in November of 2019, a poll commissioned by Children's Health Care Canada found that 73% of Canadians support the creation of a federal commissioner for child, children and youth. There is a broad belief in the public that the current system is not serving our children well, nor is it providing them a voice. The establishment of a federal commissioner for children and youth is strongly supported by the Canadian public and is seen to be urgently needed. A second reason, the provinces want this. We have received strong support from the Canadian Council of Child and Youth Advocates, a council composed of advocates and ombudspersons from every province and territory that have such an office. They view a commissioner as a partner at the federal level who would increase advocacy for children and youth. We have often been told that many issues facing children and youth deserve the attention of the federal authorities, but there is no clear path or suitable partner for the provincial and territorial advocates to reach out. Who could fill that gap by facilitating communications with Ottawa and advocating for issues that are missed by the government and by supporting the sharing of best practices throughout the country. No one better than a federal commissioner. One of the troubling realities for Canadian children is that the quality of life and well-being is very dependent on where they live. The Can Canadian Council of Child and Youth Advocates view the federal commissioner as a key to dealing with these inequities. Among the many lessons of COVID that we have learned is how far we can go together. Collaboration is key and the provincial and territorial advocates understand and value this. We have many wonderful organizations here in Canada who have been champions for children's rights but they also acknowledge that they can't provide the same level of influence and impact as could be provided by an independent officer of parliament. So why do we need advocacy? Colleagues, we have heard 
that many Canadians have been unaware of the crisis facing our children. Although the pandemic more recently has made it obvious for many of us. It is clear now more than ever that Canadian children need an advocate who would begin bring focus to the issues faced by our children. Someone who could amplify their voices on these issues. An advocate who could provide ongoing critical analysis of government action and evaluate the impact of policy on their everyday lives. An advocate who could allow us to understand where government policy has failed, has not gone far enough or in some cases has caused harm. From climate change to food insecurity to poverty, mental and physical health, to growing up in a digital age, children face many challenges that can only understand through strong and consistent advocacy and through the development of sound policy informed by applying feedback and evidence obtained through broad consultation and investigation, something that could be carried out by the Commissioner for Children and Youth. An important part of the Commissioner's advocacy would be to directly engage with children and youth so we can hear directly from them on what they're doing and going through to provide them with the means to raise their own solutions Children's solutions to children's problems, we should be listening, and they should be considered and acted upon. Where, where Canadians are blinded to the crisis that our children are living, the advocacy of the commissioner would shift the national consciousness towards raising awareness and would make us a more child-friendly country. Why the need for accountability? Well, Governments make promises that they do not enact and create policies that fall short of addressing the need for, pol of, for the policy. But because children lack a voice, there is no political consequence. Governments aren't held to account in the application of important principles, such as the Convention of the Rights of the Child and the need to ensure the best interests of children in line with Jordan's principle and other such policies. Colleagues, there is a need for far greater accountability. Accountability is key to ensuring governments act in the best interest of children and that our policies reflect their voices and needs. Accountability arising from transparency a commissioner would allow us to truly understand the impact of government action, even when the government of the day dodges its responsibility to be transparent. It would allow us to evaluate policies on the basis of outcomes and demand better from those in power. Accountability arising from independence. Canadians must be confident that a commissioner is loyal to Canadian children rather than to the government of the day. Mm -hmm. Accountability, is all, it also means seeking and ampli amplifying the voice of our children. Senator Modi, I'm sorry, I have to interrupt you. Honorable Senator, it is now 18 hours, and selon l'article 3.3, parenthèse 1 du règlement, je dois quitter le fauteuil jusqu'à 20 heures, à moins que les honorables sénateurs consentent à ne pas voir l'horloge. Is it agreed not to see the clock? Agreed. 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 Senator Moody, please continue on debate. Thank you, Your Honor. <coughs> Accountability is also seeking and amplifying the voices of our children. If politicians become accountable to children, real change can, can occur. Lowering the voting age will help to accomplish this. In the evaluation of Canada's performance in assuring the well-being of our children, when compared to 38 OECD companies, countries, UNICEF's report card shows us that despite an overall trend of rising economic wealth in Canada, many aspects of children's lives are not improving. 
In fact, Canada is amongst a handful of rich countries with the best conditions for growing up, but the poorest outcomes for children. That is because Canada's public policies are not translating our national wealth into the best possible conditions for growing up. Canada spends less to support good childhoods than most of our peer countries. Incremental advancements in public policies sustain wide gaps between children in many aspects of their lives and yield incremental advances for children overall. Yes, we have made some progress towards improving the well-being of our children, although the evidence shows that so much more can and should be done. Efforts to reduce child poverty through the Canada Child Benefit and the National Poverty Council have been somewhat successful. But we have also seen many steps backwards. In Ontario, one leader in we lost our leader in child advocacy. Despite the urgency facing the country to address this pressing crisis, our reaction is lethargic at best. Real solutions have been put forward, and these languish awaiting government attention. Take, for example, the National Autism Strategy that our colleague Senator Munson has championed for many years, or policies around advertising unhealthy foods to children, championed by our former colleague Senator Rain. And even now, in the midst of one of the greatest crises of our time, we have yet to consider the impact of the consequences of this pandemic for those who will have to live with it for the longest, our children. There's an economic argument for investing in our children. But I fear that we will fail our children in this moment and this pandemic will cause irreparable damage. As we look towards investing in our society to bring back industries, jobs, I fear we will not invest in children and families at a time when they need it the most. Because you see, our track record in this area is not good. Canada ranks poorly when it comes to investment in children. We, invest, we invested 1.68% of our GDP in our children, compared to the OECD average of 2.38%, while top-performing countries invest over 3%. Our lack of investment in children has serious consequences. Take, for example, the Canada Child Benefit. We know the Canada Child Benefit has had some success including helping a quarter million families rise out of poverty. It has contributed to economic growth, accounting for 2% of our GDP in 2017-18 fiscal year. Yet it does not go far enough. Compared to our OECD peers, we are 33rd in enrollment in early childhood education, for example. And we rank in the top 10 of the nations for the most expensive child care. So while over half a million children have risen out of poverty, we have not done much to improve them any further. And to be clear, many children remain in poverty. And for those who have risen above the poverty line, we would be well to remember there is a big difference between being just above the poverty line and living comfortably. Here in Canada, we have seen an increase in income inequality where children are concerned. There is an abundance of evidence that demonstrates that income inequality is an indicator of poor outcomes for children. It's also a good indicator of the well-being of children. We must recognize the correlation of increasing in inequality, income inequality and worsening child mortality rates. The threat of inequality is the threat that many Canadian children will be left behind. This is a threat that is especially true for black children, indigenous children, and children with disabilities. 
the potential and increasing likely reality of a K-shaped recovery is more than going to make life difficult for many children. And for some, it may mean death. We are a vast and diverse country. Canadians from coast to coast have different needs, but deserve the same quality of services, care, and help from their government. This is especially true for our children. But as we have seen, lukewarm investments lead to poor results. Children's well-being is an economic issue. Children know when there's not a whole lot of food in the house or when the bills barely got paid that month. They feel the stress of their parents and sometimes even suffer the consequences of increased abuse. At an age when children should be imagining, playing, and being creative and learning, they're having to deal with harsh realities for which they are not equipped. This impact is greater than meets the eye when a child is burdened with the weight of poverty and hunger, they can't look up to the stars and wander. Po poverty snuffs out the sparks of creativity, imagination, curiosity, ingenuity, innovation, and passion that we find in our society. By not investing in our children, we deprive our future of talented, intelligent, and world-changing adults. Why would we do this to ourselves? A commissioner for children and youth has the potential to light a fire under the feet of our policy makers, our decision makers, and our leaders. To build urgency, to build a greater level of accountability, and to force government and parliamentarians to accept nothing less than real and effective action. And this means putting money where it matters most and not cheaping out on our children. Children deserve more than incomplete and fragmented ineffective solutions. They deserve to be considered as a priority, not as an afterthought. They deserve a champion who will collaborate to build based on long-term vision and strategy. And as Canadians grapple with a new reality that is rapidly changing our lives, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought the issues facing our children and youth into very sharp focus. It has unmasked the unique ways that children are made vulnerable and the urgent need to put in place immediately the resources, supports, and protections that have been missing for all Canadian children. It has deepened the crisis they face. It has made things worse for our kids. And we see, we've, seen, we've seen them suffer in silence. Food insecurity, domestic abuse, interruptions in their daily routines and education, delays in receiving medical care, worsening immunization rates are some of the more severe issues we are seeing. And we've We've been quick to push towards distance education without really considering the proportion of children without access to reliable internet, to the right devices, or to the supports of parents to take over the critical role of homeschooling. And when we contemplated reopening, yes, we focused on returning to golf, to bars, and to clubs. Schools and daycares were a secondary priority for us. We focused on the economy and returned to work, and we just assumed that the issues that affected our children would simply melt away. We did not consider the lasting effects on our children, effects that will linger longer after the initial damage was done. We assumed our kids would be okay, but they are not. We have failed not only in some of the actions we took, but because we did not give our children the consideration they truly deserve. We need a commissioner for times like this. And as Canada becomes more prosperous, the well-being of our children is falling behind, 
As a country, we have failed to invest in families and children, neither consistently or enough. Children do not just follow along. They need our targeted and our focused attention. The Independent Office of Parliament will hold Parliament accountable to its obligations for the well-being of children and youth and to ensure that their rights are respected. We'll collaborate with all levels of government, with communities to work on behalf of children and youth, to advocate for their needs and to understand and address the issues they face. To support and expand the work of provincial partners and to bring national focus to issues that are affecting the provinces, territories and nations. One of the most important aspects of the role of the Commission of Children and Youth will be working in collaboration and on request to along with First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples. The Commissioner would partner with communities to address the failure of the federal government to meet its specific obligations under the Constitution towards Indigenous children and youth. The Commissioner would ad help address some of the recommendations for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and calls for justice for the inquiry on missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls and support the implementation of the C-92, applying pressure to government where needed to move matters along. In this role, the commissioner could provide and be a bridge to the federal government, specifically for children's issues, when called upon and invited to provide support by Indigenous Peoples of Canada. The Commissioner will exercise oversight on government legislation, examine every piece of legislation, every change in regulation, every exercise of policy instrument, to comment, report on the impacts of specific actions legislatively on Canadian children. The Commissioner would collaborate with the public services, be a resource for our committees, advise parliamentarians, providing timely information, current evidence on the state of Canadian children, would promote the use of good data and evidence-based decision-making in the development of legislation and policy. The Commissioner will elevate the voice of children and youth in our political discourse and draw out the concerns for young Canadians through online and in-person engagement going to children to hear their voice, meeting with them in difficult circumstances in places such as juvenile detention centers and other institutions. Children deserve to be heard like any other Canadian. We must listen, hear their problems, hear their own solutions to their problems, and we must create a safe place for them to share their concerns. The Commissioner for Children and Youth will have the responsibility to educate all children and parents and all of Canada on the rights of children. And so we need an independent officer of parliament. The commissioner must have the capacity to function independently and to use this independently, this independence to achieve meaningful advocacy. The Commissioner should be able to look past the politics of the day to focus on long-term needs of children and to bring them to the attention of Parliament. The Commissioner's work should be driven by evidence. All Canadians must be able to trust the Commissioner will not be influenced by the government of the day. Bill S-210 will guide the interaction of the Office of the Commissioner with children and communities of all backgrounds. The Commissioner will acknowledge and respect Indigenous sovereignty and be invited to assist and support when called upon. An effective Commissioner will be knowledgeable about communities and be sensitive to their culture and practices and to assist commun communities in the preservation of that culture and of their language. And we see 
an expectation, like Sarah Knockwood, that there will be a reflection in the structure and the staffing of the office that will reflect the diversity of Canadian communities, that senior roles will be filled by folks who understand and have lived experience for, of the reality of vulnerable Canadians. Sarah recommends an Indigenous commissioner as the first appointee. Well, I, I would back her with that. That sounds like a good idea to me too. The commissioner would be an important voice and a long-lasting partner to strengthen relationships across Canada. And so, as we look together to build a better society suited for all children, this is why I chose to introduce this bill and to make this speech today. Senators, when we gathered in June, I stated that this ought to be viewed as an emergency legislation. Today, six months later, the after the beginning of our pandemic, we continue to owe our children our obligation our urgency and our action, our obligation to recognize the power and the responsibility that we as parliamentarians hold to address these problems. Together, we must realize the urgency of the problems that Canadian children and youth face. And most importantly, together, we must move to action. Today in Canada, we have an opportunity to make sure that every child Every Canadian child has an opportunity to thrive in this land. As we move forward in consideration of this bill, colleagues, I look forward to dialogue that we'll have and to hearing your comments and to making improvements to our bill. I encourage you to vote for this bill and to support its passage. Let us give children and youth the voice they deserve and need. Let us show communities that we care enough to give them the resources they ask for. Let us show Indigenous Canadians that we respect them as nations and that we are serious about working towards repairing the despair and the damage of colonialism. Let us show the world that we are serious about our human rights obligations. Let us show Canadians that in a true democracy, we are not afraid of accountability and welcome honest scrutiny. Let us show children and youth that here in Ottawa, there are people who care and listen and are ready to do what we have known for a long time we needed to do. Because the cost of failure is too high and we must not lose to inaction. As we sit here in the chamber, we must acknowledge that Canada is not where it needs to be. We are in a land full of potential and opportunity, but the pandemic has helped to shatter what has already been broken. Will we pick up the pieces and build something better and be more inclusive for our children? That's the question I pose to you today, colleagues. Thank you. I'm happy to answer questions. Senator Patterson, do you want to ask a question? Yes. You have two minutes and seven seconds. Okay, well, look, uh, let me not for a moment, Senator Moody, question the merits of, uh, you know, giving a stronger voice to children. I know you've worked very hard on this. But it seems to me that establishing a commission and the necessary support staff, as you've, as you've described, will require the expenditures of money. I'm wondering, and that's apparently uh, outside the powers of the Senate, I wonder if you've thought of this issue and whether you've approached the federal government to see whether they could sponsor the bill and thereby eliminate this problem of uh, needing a royal recommendation. Senator Modi. Thank you, Senator Patterson, uh, for the question. And yes, we've been working very hard to approach the, uh, a number of individuals on the side of the House of Commons, the ministers. Um, we're, we're in good discussion. Uh, the path that we have chosen to take is one in which we're using a coming into force clause that allows us to pass the bill through both chambers without needing royal recommendation initially. But it is our recognition that uh, being able to integrate 
our bill into another bill that would be funded would be one viable and strong pathway. And also, we are also looking for other ways to get uh, individuals on the side of the House of Commons to pick up our bill.